Well, a couple weeks ago, I took my wife and kids and I, we all went to the New River Gorge National Park, uh, the newest national park in America. And yes, thank you, uh, in West Virginia. And sort of the centerpiece of this new national park is the New River Gorge Bridge. Uh, this massive bridge spans across a gorge in the Appalachian Mountains uh, that was cut by the New River, one of the few rivers that flow from south to north on the planet. And this bridge is massive. Uh, it's about 3,000 feet long, and for decades, it was the world's longest single-spanned arched bridge. Uh, it also sits 876 feet above the river below it. Uh, that made it one of the highest vehicular bridges in the world. It was the highest when it was constructed back in the late 1970s. Uh, the ranger told us it's like the Washington Monument with two statues of liberty stacked on top. That's how tall the bridge is, right? Uh, and so my family and I, uh, you're able to buy some tickets and walk on the catwalk on that bridge. So I think we have a picture of the people I love most in this world suspended precariously above the earth <laughs> from the New River Bridge. Now you'd say, why would you do that? Well, before we did that, we uh, took a long winding drive down to the base of the bridge where we learned that there is as much concrete under the earth as there is steel above it. That for feet and feet down into the earth, Massive columns of concrete were poured, the 900 feet uh, of support piers, this height of most skyscrapers, sit underneath this bridge. And so the reason we were confident in ascending to these heights we could never have reached on our own was because we went and saw that it is built on something strong and unshakable. You see now, why am I telling you this? Because we're talking about this series, Resurrection Power, that really all spring we've been talking about how to live a supernatural life. What does it really mean to be godly people? And I would say to be a godly person, live a godly life, a spiritual life, a supernatural life, that is meant to be built on the unshakable substructure of what God is doing. That the Spirit of God moving is what gives us the ability to live a supernatural life. That we can be who we're meant to be under God because of what God has done underneath us. See? Now, uh, it was interesting. I remember hearing John Piper years ago tell the story of a Cistercian monk. Uh, and if you don't know the Cistercian uh, order, they are a highly disciplined uh, order of monks that uh, spend most of their time in solitude and silence. And he told the story of a monk uh, in Italy who was interviewed, and the interviewer asked him the question about his ascetic monastic life. And he asked them, what if you were to realize at the end of your life that atheism's true? <laughs> there is no God. Tell me, what if it were true? And the abbot replied, holiness, silence, and sacrifice are beautiful in themselves, even without the promise of reward. I still will have used my life well. He said, even if none of this is true, this was still a good life. And I remember Dr. Piper going, you know what's so fascinating about that is the Apostle Paul profoundly disagrees. We just read it in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, if that supernatural event of Jesus Christ beating death and rising from the grave, if he's not been raised, our preaching is in vain, vapid, of no substance, worthless, and your faith is in vain. And he says, not only that, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. All who've fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope for this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. 
He says, everything we're doing here is a huge waste of time and money if God did not raise Jesus Christ from the grave. And so for us, we're talking about the implications of the resurrection. This whole spiritual enterprise is built on the resurrection. If you pull that out, it's like when I played Jenga with my oldest daughter. Uh, Her tactic, if you ever play it with her, I'll give it away, is to take the two outside structures out of the bottom layer first. And so it doesn't matter how beautiful your Jenga structure is. If it's precariously rested on something unstable, it all comes crashing down. And Paul says, this spiritual life we're talking about is vanity unless it rests on something supernatural and unshakable, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. And it's fascinating, and I won't read them all, although I pulled them all and read them all myself. Every passage where Jesus in the gospel said, it is necessary, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die and be raised from the grave. He told his disciples that multiple, multiple times. It has to be this way. I must suffer. I must die. Then I will be raised. It has to be that way. It's also the centerpiece of the book of Acts. As the early church was born, every sermon in Acts is not just references the resurrection. It's rooted in the resurrection. All that we're talking about to be a truly spiritual person is rested upon this reality. Paul in 1 Corinthians, the passage we read, said, I passed along to you as of first importance. The primary place we got to start is that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. And he was buried and he was raised on the third day. And many people saw him at the end of that. And so in Ephesians... As Paul was writing to this community of people, he prays for them at the beginning. And this is my prayer for us as we start this series. In Ephesians 1, he tells them, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. He said, I'm praying that God would, would by his spirit, give you wisdom and revelation. You would understand things and realize the implications of them by his spirit that you would know of him, that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. I pray you'd be aware of some things that you may know the hope that he's called you to. I want you to be aware and have confidence in the good future prepared for you and one of the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So before Paul starts talking about how to live a spiritual life, he says, I am just praying that you would understand that the same power that raised Jesus from the grave is the power that's at work in you. And when you understand that, so many implications flow from that, that look, if you don't believe this, you can live a decent life. You can live a a disciplined life. You can live a good life. But the Bible's calling you to a supernatural life, to a godly life, and a godly life sits on the substructure of what God is doing. And of first importance at the center of it is Jesus Christ died and was raised from the grave. And what I want to do over this month together as we prepare for Easter is I want us to understand the implications of the resurrection. A friend of mine wrote a book with a great title. The title was, If the Tomb is Empty, Anything is Possible. And so I want us to understand the implications. But before we do that, we need to understand what we're talking about. And that's where we are today. I could give you all the implications of the resurrection. And yet, if you don't really know the story, it's going to be a bit confusing to you. So a little window uh, into me as your pastor. Uh, my first couple of years in ministry, I didn't preach that much. I mean, I started preaching fairly young. But when I first started in ministry, uh, I had a youth group of uh, about 10 kids uh, that I grew to about three. Uh, and, you know, we went up from there, okay? Uh, but 
in the early days of ministry, for me, it wasn't, uh, there were no mics attached to my head. It wasn't on a stage in front of people. It was a lot of sitting around circles, opening the Bible in our laps and teaching it. Or for me, I was at a, a young church plant that just didn't have a lot of high school and middle school students and I was a high school, middle school pastor. So it was me spending a lot of time at Taco Bell with kids that I would meet. And uh, my youth group, as it began to grow, was comprised almost entirely of punks. And I'm using that term technically. Uh, they wore a lot of black and uh, safety pins and uh, splashes of pink. Uh, they called themselves the pink punks. And, uh, and I would sit with them. And I remember I got in the rhythm of asking the question, hey, before we talk about spirituality, because they had all these like random questions and all the politics of it and whatever. And I was like, just be before we get into all these kind of offshoot rabbit trails, do you even know what the story of this is about? I mean, before we talk about the implications and ramifications, like, do you even know the story the Bible's telling about who God is and who you are? And they almost always said no. And then I would ask them, do you mind if I just take a few minutes to explain it to you? And then we can answer questions. And they almost always said yes. And then I would pull out a piece of paper and I would draw for them in a simple way, kind of the centerpiece of the story of why this matters. And I would like to do that with you now, if I can do this right. So let me see if I can work an iPad together. This is what I would draw the pink punk. So gather around at Taco Bell, everybody. Get a gordita and uh, let's talk. What I would do for them uh, first, is this thing gonna show up there? Do we know? Or else I'm gonna have a good time, but oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> I would start by asking them to describe God. Now, the conversation may leap off the rails right there because someone may say, well, I don't believe in God. And you go, okay, well, so maybe we can talk a little bit about that. And you know, then you could get into some of the reasons of, of it takes as much, if not more faith, to believe that all things came from nothing than to believe that all things came from someone. That when you see intelligent design, you are naturally infer an intelligent designer. I do this with my kids every time we hike. I did it with the New River Gorge Bridge. I was like, kids, isn't that wild that just... Wind and erosion over time created that structure, and they go, Dad, you know, because they know <laughs> I'm joking that when you see architectural design, you assume an architect who built it. And when you see the wonder of the universe, you go, Somebody built this. And so I go, So we can get into some of that, uh, that all causes, effects have a cause, and you must go back to a first cause, an uncaused cause, and you call them whatever you want, I call them God. And so then on we go. But let's say, like most human beings on the planet, they believe there is a God. I would ask them, tell me about him. What are some attributes of God? And then I would write down the ones that were right. <laughs> uh, they would say things like, God is love. And I would say, yes, absolutely. Um, John 4, 8 says, God is love. Uh, that he is true, yes. Jesus said to his father, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. That he is, you could say, ultimate reality. You could say um, life. There's, a, there's an old term for God. Um, let's see if I can write it on here. Fons divinitatis. the divine fountainhead. So he just isn't just these things. He's the fount from which all proceeds. Uh, Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all who dwell in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Colossians 1 says, all things were created by him in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible. And Romans 11 says, for from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be the glory forever and ever, amen. So he is the fountain from which all these things proceed. And we could go on and on with all his different attributes. And, and often I would write sort of the verse addresses next to him. I don't have as much real estate here, but I would kind of give them the verse references as we would talk. And then after we explained who God is, the fountain of all life and all love and truth and beauty and creativity, 
we would talk about, well, who are we? What is humanity? What are we? And the Bible says, you didn't come here for good artistry, folks, just by the way. Just, <laughs> Genesis 1.27 says about us that we are made in the image of God. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it doesn't mean we're like him in every way, but it's interesting. You can debate on what it means, but being in the image of God is mentioned in two other places in the Bible after Genesis 1. It's the basis by which you don't kill someone later in Genesis. You don't murder because that person's made in the image of God. And in James, it's the basis by which you don't curse somebody. So I don't use words to hurt you and I don't use my body to hurt you. Why? Because you're made in the image of God. So whatever you believe image of God means, the Bible uses it as an assumption of dignity, that you have a dignity because God crafted you in his image. That means every human being has value. Every human being, regardless of their capacity, has value and dignity, right? Uh, a baby is worth more than a TV. Why? That baby has value. That baby has dignity. Contra Peter Singer, who says what I just said there is speciesism. I say, no, I think intrinsically for many of us, we understand that. There's something beautiful about human beings that we are of greater value than trinkets or even animals, that we have a dignity. And the Bible says, yes, that's because the master has laid his hands on you in a unique way, right? And we are made in his image to love him and enjoy him forever, right? This is the the life of humanity. What is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love one another as yourself. That we are meant to live in his love, expressing his truth, enjoying his life, manifesting his creativity, that we are meant to, to live in unbroken intimacy with the God who made us. That's what human beings were designed for. That's what we long for, is love that is unshakable, that creativity that's inexhaustible. We long for life. And yet there's something wrong with us. There's a problem. And what the Bible will say is in uh, Romans chapter one, although they knew God, they neither glorified God. They didn't marvel at him and love him the way they were meant to, nor did they give thanks. And because of that lack of intimacy with God, it says in Romans 1, 21, their foolish hearts were darkened. That by breaking faith with God, something broke in us. So the image of God is still there. The beauty's there, but there's a brokenness to it. There's the dignity's there, but there's a depravity to it, Right? Uh, Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, sin is a word that means um, there was a target we were meant to hit and we didn't hit it. Uh, it means there was something we're meant to be and we're not it. We feel that, all of us do. You look in the mirror and you understand there's a value to you and yet you understand you're not all that you're meant to be. And bookstores and Amazon are filled with books trying to help you ascend to heights that we just can't seem to get back to on our own because we all admit there's something wrong with us. And the Bible says, yeah, we broke faith with our maker. And when we broke intimacy with him, something broke in us. And because of that, Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Can you all read this okay? A wage is a payment. A wage is uh, uh, what you receive for work done. And the payment for, for the sin of humanity, the, the willful separation from intimacy with God, is death separation from him for eternity. Death's just a part of life, Forrest. No. 
Technically, death is the cessation of life. It is therefore the opposite of life. The Bible presents death as an enemy. That if we are meant to live in, in life, love and truth and beauty and creativity forever, the great tragedy here is that we are separated from the author of life, from the fountain of love, from the river of truth, and that separation endures. This is the tragedy of the Bible, right? That's the bad news. Everybody with me so far? And yet, here's the good news. In John 3, 16, put that, I don't know where we're gonna put it, put it right here. John 3, 16. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Put him right here. Good enough. <laughs> Did I mention my wife's the artist in the family? I read books. Um, the Bible tells us that God's solution to our sin is a savior, a rescuer. Uh, John 1.14 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then John 1.14 says, and that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth, that the father sent the son to be God's representative to us. That Jesus isn't just a, a prophet. He wasn't just an inspirational teacher. The Bible says the word of God, who is with God and was God, became flesh and dwelt among us. That's profound. And, and Hebrews chapter four, uh, verse 15 says, he was made in every respect, tempted as we are, yet without sin. So he was fully God as the son of God, same stuff as God and yet fully human, tempted in every way we were, except he did not sin, right? Uh, Hebrews 2.14 says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he likewise partook of the same thing. And then it tells us why. That through death, he might destroy the one who had the power of death. That is the devil, the one who through and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Here he came to represent God to us and he lived the perfect human life. Where we failed, he did not. And then the scripture says he died. Um... I deliver unto you as of first importance what I receive. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. So if the wages of sin is death, he never sinned. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So he knew no sin, tempted in every way we were, our perfect representative, yet without sin. And yet he took on death. If the wages of sin is death, he did not sin. He should not have died. So whose wage was he paying for? Ours. That's whose. He was not just God's representative to us. He was our representative to God. I will be the perfect human substitute uh, to take their wrath for them. Romans 5.8. I've got to write some of these on here. Sorry. Romans 5.8. God shows his love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. He took our place so that he could take our sin and we could take his life, right? Now, all that sounds great, and, and often I would stop the picture there at some level, but if, if he says, I died to take your sin out of the way so that you could be right with God, 
I want to be the bridge that restores you to this intimacy you lost. How do we know it worked? How do you know that's going to happen? Uh, I, there was a magician uh, in the 90s that said, I am the next Houdini and I am greater than Houdini. And so he went to prove it by burying himself alive. And he died. So he wasn't. <laughs> because if you're going to make a claim like that, you got to prove it. And if you say, I'm, I'm greater than the greatest escape artist of all time, you got to escape. <laughs> or else we don't believe you. And if Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, whoever believes in me will not perish, but will live. If he stays dead, the best we can say is maybe. Paul will be even starker and say, waste of time. We should be doing something else. Yeah. And so for Jesus, it's not just that he died for us. It's that he died for our sins. He was buried. And then three days later, he rose again. That stone is rolled away. We've used this illustration before. If, if you go to prison for a crime, we say you're paying your debt to society. How do you know when that debt has been paid? The prison door opens and you go free. Jesus says, I am paying the debt of your sin as the representative of humanity. How do we know if that really happened? Because three days later, that stone moved the prison door opened, and I love the way Acts 2 says it. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Death could not hold him. You see it? I love it in Revelation. One of the things Jesus says about himself at the end, behold, I died and I am alive, and I have the keys of death and Hades. He said, I went to the grave, and I stole the keys, and now I'm driving. And what I'm doing is I'm making a way where there was no way. That your path was death. That's where you were headed. Separation from God, and life, and love, and beauty, and truth. But when he interposed his precious blood, he created a new and living path through his body that we can be something else, right? That we can be somewhere else. That's the idea. God shows his love for us in this, Romans 5 says, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore now we've been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more that we're reconciled will we be saved by his life? If we were this and he did this, how much more will he do this because we're this? If he has knit me together with his son, where his son goes, I go. That's the beauty of the cross. Romans 1 says he was declared to be the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. That resurrection didn't make him the son of God. It declared it with power that he was. So that if you ever doubted it, beating death silenced that discussion. No, that's that guy. And Romans 4 says he was delivered up for our trespass and raised for our justification. His resurrection was vindication. His payment worked. And so he says, so you go where I go and you can be just. That is made right with God because of what I have done. Ephesians 2, let me write that in here. I'm gonna quote too many verses. I'll just write Ephesians 2. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, made us alive with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith. Not as a result of works. It is a gift of God. Right? What is grace? Grace is undeserved kindness. Kind to you, you don't deserve it, but I am anyway. What is saved? It means you're in a spot you couldn't get yourself out of. So I got you. Right? Uh, what is faith? By the kindness of God, you've been rescued by faith. Why are we saved by faith? Because faith is an empty hand. If he said you're saved by love, we got to do something to show we love him. If he said we're saved by service, we got to serve. But he saves us. We don't save us. Faith is, ah, it's I got nothing. And he's like, exactly. And you're saved. It's a gift, not a wage. Very different things. If I, uh, if I gift you something, here, I, I got you this iPhone, right? and I say, pop, 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 give me $100, you'd say, it's not a gift. Now, now it's a transaction. Now I'm buying it. But if it's a gift, what do you got to do? Yeah, you just walk off with it. You just take it. The wages of our sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through his son, right? And what's great about that is Ephesians tells us, having believed, we were marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, guaranteeing what is to come, that God begins to work on us. So look, you've been raised with him and seated with him, Ephesians says, but are you still a mess? Like, yeah, you're still totally a mess. Like uh, uh, St. Augustine was right. We're a masa picate, a mess of sin. And yet Jesus has raised us with him and he is even now working in us by his spirit. And that presence of his spirit has implications both in this age and in the age to come. That's the idea. Do you see it? Uh, I'll close it this way. First John 5, John said this. Well, let me write that on. First John 5. 11 through 13. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has the life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know you have eternal life. Uh, so back at Taco Bell, I had a lady on staff with me and this is how she would end the conversation. She would read that passage. And she would take whatever soft drink we had and said, this is the son of God. Not literally ontologically, it's an illustration. She said, if this is the son of God, she'd stick a straw in it. She said, this is life. She'd throw the straw in it. And then she'd say, whoever has the son has life. If you don't have the son, you don't have life. She was like, so if you take the son you get life along with it. You take the soda, you get the straw. You embrace the sun, you get the life of the sun. And you get the life of intimacy with God you were made for, purchased by his blood, vindicated by his resurrection, right? And he says, I write these things to you who believe. That's what it takes. That you would know you have eternal life. Not guess, not hope, No. Right? And then she would ask them, where are you? Same question I'd ask you. Where are you? You know what most kids would say? They would go, I think I'm here. And you go, no, that's not a thing. That's not, you can't <laughs> be suspended in real life. You're not here either. No one's born in the garden. You're, you're either here or you're here because of what he did here. You know, where, where would you say you are? And someone would say, well, I'm right here. And I'm like, well, that's fair. Yeah, you're, you're sort of checking it all out. And if you're checking it all out, good. We're so glad you're here. I said, but this is the offer of the Bible. Not you do something to earn the smile of God. It's not for sale. 
But intimacy with the Almighty is available through Jesus Christ. Why? Because, uh, it's interesting, before they built that bridge over the New River Gorge, massive, thousand foot gorge, you had communities separated that had no intimacy and connection. So when they took the years it took to build that massive bridge, people who had been separated for generations were now able to cross the other side. And right now, if you drive over it, it takes about one minute. That an incrossable gulf is crossed in a minute because of that bridge. But God built a bridge that what was separated for generations is now crossable because of Jesus Christ's son, right? Uh, it's interesting, I, every time I did this with my little punks, they often had questions, and you may too, and I think that's fair, and that's good. This is the start of the series, not the end. Uh, but you know what they would all say? Is uh, they'd say, but can I take that piece of paper? Because I wanna look up those verses later. And I'd say, yeah, absolutely. You can't take my iPad. I need this for the next gathering. <laughs> but you just keep coming back. This is what we're selling here. Now, this is just the beginning. If the tomb is empty, there's a lot of implications from the resurrection, both now and in the age to come. But before we talk about those, we got to ask this question. What have you done with the Son? Because if you didn't rise from the grave, this is futile. You're still in your sins. Those who died are still buried. And we of all people are most to be pitied. But if he did rise, the inverse of all that is true. We're forgiven. Our faith is well-founded in something unshakable. Those who have died in Christ are with him in glory, and we will be with him too. And we have the greatest of all relationships available today, not because we made our way to him, but because he built a bridge to us. Do you know him? When you believe, you can know you have eternal life in his son.